Jesus? Is this on? Okay. John 3, 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Life has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. 1 John 3:11 through 19 For this is the message you heard from the beginning we should love one another do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother and why did he murder him because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous do not be surprised my brothers and sisters if the world hates you we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other anyone who does not love remains in death Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Good morning. If you'll bow with me in prayer, we'll start in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you, Lord, that you are worthy of all praise, glory, and honor, that you would love us and create us, that you will desire to be with us, to have a relationship with us, and even though we sinned against you, Father, that you have passionately pursued us throughout the, the years of history as we know it, and that you sent your one and only Son at just the right time, while we were still sinners, to die for us to pay the price for our sins, to redeem us back to you. Lord, help us to believe, increase our faith, and help us to be the children that you have called us to be. Empower us with your spirit, sanctify us with your spirit and your truth, to be like Jesus in this world until we meet him face to face. We pray that in his precious name. Amen. So I entitled this, The Proof is in the Pudding. You know what that means? I'll explain it a little bit more in a minute. Last thing that you read in last year's reading plan was you read through the Gospel of John and then you read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. John's Gospel is written so that you believe. You've got believe right up there. Oh, and there's a pudding thing right below it. John's Gospel is so that you believe, so that you live a life of love. Believe is mentioned nearly 100 times, around 100 times, however you want to put that in different forms. And love is mentioned somewhere around 50 times. But if you noticed when you got to 1 John, man, all you kept reading every few words was love, 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 love. Written from the disciple who was a son of thunder who became known as a disciple of love. Probably the last one around writing these words at the time for the church, and the church is facing heresy again that's coming into the church. And let me explain a little bit about that in 1 John. As you read through it and you read that we have an advocate in the Father if we do sin, that's telling you that, first of all, that the Spirit of God lives inside of you. You have the ability to overcome sin. Probably won't in this world, don't get me wrong. You are sanctified when, when you believe in Jesus Christ, set apart, made holy, and sanctification is a continual process. And the Scriptures say that we're sanctified by the Spirit and by truth. 
And the truth is Jesus, the Word that was made flesh among us, and we read His Word. That's why I push a reading plan for you each year so that together we will do it because separately we would probably fall short so many times. But if we're here to spur one another on to good deeds and to have fellowship and to read God's Word, we have a better chance at doing it. You try to work out your physical body on your own again, which is good for this world, but this is so much better and has rewards for this world and for the future. It's so much easier if you have a partner going along and helping you. And we are all the body of Christ. We're talking about that in membership and everything. And each part has an integral part in the body as the Spirit gives the abilities for that part to function in the body so that we literally can be the body of Christ in this world, to be the hands and feet of Jesus until He returns. So as you're reading that, you can see some of the false doctrines that are being taught of that day. It's been... A generation so to speak since Jesus passed away John is still living and in the church there are people saying that hey you're all right your sins are covered so you can live however you want to that's one of the heresies one of the other heresies that was being spoken is you don't sin anymore you really don't you're you know you're better than you were before and I hear that a lot now and some of the things that on Moody and different places that, that you read you hear these people that say yeah well I'm pretty much done with sin well, you know, every time I think that thought, even in the remotest, it's like Satan just jumps on you and starts pounding you, doesn't he? Because when you think you can do it on your own, boy, you're in for trouble. And if you really want patience, what do you do? If you really want a loving heart, what do you do? And you pray for that and you see what happens because you'll get just the opposite to really try and test you. More than likely, that's the case. But John says that all through this, you've got to be a people who love 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 another thing that satan does is he comes in and he gets people that are christians to doubt he gets them to be complacent and one of the things that john has written from this from his uh fir the first letter to the churches is he doesn't want those christians to doubt their faith either how do you know for sure that you're saved you ever wondered most christians do <laughs> I'm going to even put it and be bold enough to go and say all Christians do at some point, especially when those struggles and doubts come along. Or am I really, really saved? It should be a question that you should ask. Because the Scripture says, Jesus says, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord. That weeping and gnashing of teeth is not from the ones that said, I don't want any part of Jesus. It's from the ones that wanted to associate with Jesus and even did mighty works in His name but didn't have fellowship with him, did not truly know him. So how can you know without a doubt that you are saved? Go back and read 1 John again if you missed it. Go back and read John chapter 13 again if you missed it. You will be known by the way that you truly love. Not the deeds, that's why these, these so-called disciples were able to do mighty deeds in the name of Jesus, even cast out demons. But on that day, Jesus said, Depart from me, I don't know you. Because they wasn't defined in their heart. They didn't know love because they didn't know that how much God loved them because of what He did for Jesus Christ. And then we let that love flow out of us in the Spirit. So are you a child of God? The proof is in the pudding, so to speak. Okay, that's what that means if you're not familiar with it. The original phrase was the proof is in the pudding and the taste or something. I can't remember how it went exactly. But it means that not everything that appears to be pudding is pudding. Girls, ready for your help? They're get, helping me with a sermon illustration today. The proof is in the pudding, right? I believe that these are both puddings. But are they? Do they look like pudding? Look pretty similar, don't they? Okay, you want to pour the contents in that bowl? You can come around in this bowl, turn it in and pour the contents. You've got to whisk these together for about five minutes. And you can sit on the pew here, wherever you want to whisk, but don't spill it all over you. And the proof is in the pudding, yeah, how it smells, how it looks, but how it tastes, right? That's why I went ahead and told you what the full saying is. The proof of the, of the pudding is in the taste. 
All right, I got to get you roughly the same amount of milk. So why don't you put this over here and let's compare. This one looks like it's a little wider though, doesn't it? Yeah, but this is a wider bowl, so I think we're about the same. And I could go all kind of places with this sermon illustration, how you have to mix in the Holy Spirit and so on, but I won't. We're just going to look. See, you can take it and whisk away. We're going to see what we come out with. Go ahead, sit down. You're going to be whisking for a minute. You've got to whisk it till it, you can let me know when it looks good. The proof of which one the pudding is, is in the results. There are many out there that profess, I know Jesus Christ. I am a believer. Well, Scripture says, first of all, that you will be a disciple. Jesus said, these are my disciples. That means that you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Him. It's not just a belief. It's a belief that affects your heart, that affects the way you live, so that you're known by the way that you love. Isn't that what I basically just said? That's the proof in it. So did you read your devotional this week? <laughs> Are you spending time with Jesus? And yeah, I'm going to push you, even if it makes you mad, because that's what I'm supposed to do. If it makes you mad, then I'm pushing you. Did you read your devotional? This takes more of a commitment than it did last year. Man, this devotional. Again, if I had planned all this and wrote it myself, I couldn't have done any differently. Yesterday would have been January 7th, right? And the reading that went along with the devotional was First John. <laughs> First John chapter 4, verses 7 to 21. That's where the devotional, I didn't plan that, which is what I planned to preach on a, uh, two weeks ago because we got behind at Christmas and I, I got to finish up John about believing so that I can get into First John about how to live. And here we are with this devotional. The gospel displayed, that's what we're doing is we're displaying the gospel in the way that we live. Philippians 1.27, only let your manner of, life, manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Do you live a life of worth or do you just live? I mean, you might be a Christian. We might call each of them pudding. I don't, I don't know what we're going to have when we're done. But the proof is in the tasting. The proof is how you live your life how you live a life of love. Jesus said it. John repeated it. John is proof of that. How this works, again, if you don't know, you've got the date up there, okay? You've got a scripture that goes along with a devotional, and then at the bottom is a scripture reading that he's suggesting you read with this particular uh, devotion. And then you have a head down here, a heart, and a hand. To let it know how it affects your mind so that it affects your heart so that it affects your actions. Exactly what we're talking about. And then at the bottom is a year reading plan. And that may match these devotions. It may not. The way he did the first part of it was you look in Genesis and then you go to, to Romans. You see the creation there and then you see in Romans how that mankind is without excuse because they never gave God the praise that He deserved. They said, this is fine, we want to live our lives the way we are. And God even let them go on to their own depravity and stuff. And as we're reading Genesis through, which we did, we got up to like Genesis chapter 19, you saw that in history, but God still loved. And even though He only found one righteous man, He spared him and his family by building an ark, which is a symbol of Jesus Christ. So these devotions spoke so much. Yeah, they'll take you about 30 minutes during the day. I read all of the scripture reading before Wednesday so that I could have it all done, and I worked each day prior to that. So don't tell me you did not have time. That is a lame, lame excuse. You have time for what really matters to you, and it's seen in the things that you spend your money on and you spend your time on. What is more important, living a life of worth or just living? And what about that day when you meet Jesus face to face? Do you know for sure, without a doubt, that you're His? Oh, the proof is in the pudding in how you live, that you live a life of love. The devotionals were entitled, if you didn't get this, King of creation, behold our God, every promise fulfilled, contented in Christ, our great high priest, cherishing God's word and the gospel displayed again. 
exactly the life of a Christian who really believes that God loves them so much and God is who He is. We started out in the first one in Revelation with the devotional, and you see in the throne room of God these beings that we cannot even fathom who are worshiping God. And it immediately makes me think, how am I worshiping God with the life that He's given me, redeemed by the blood of His only Son? I don't know anything about those beings. I don't know... Uh, how powerful they are, how they came to be in heaven. But I know how I did. Because God loved me so much that He gave His one and only Son to be my atoning sacrifice. That if I believe in Him, I will not perish but have everlasting life. How can I not love God in return because of the love that He first gave me? How's it coming? Are they thickened up yet? Okay, you got to wait a little bit. Got to listen to my sermon. See, I trapped you. <laughs> okay, we're going to go over a little root word study. We're going to go through vocabulary lesson because I knew if I just said vocabulary lesson, you wouldn't be here. There are different words for, for love in the Bible, okay? And we use the word love totally differently. I love you, Merle. means total difference than I tell my wife I love her means total difference even in the way I tell my wife I love her when I, when I just come home and see her or tell her on the phone versus we're intimate. Love in the Bible has different forms and the word that you see the most used in John is agape, the godly love that we're supposed to have because God loves us and we share that love with one another. A love that you cannot know outside of knowing Jesus Christ. You cannot understand it, so you will never comprehend how to love your enemy. But you will if you get the mindset in the heart of Jesus, because that's why He faced the cross with joy in His heart. Because He was offering salvation to me. I was His enemy at that point, so don't let me think too highly of who I am or say that I'm without sin or anything else. Because I am a sinner saved by grace, and that grace that, that God continues to pour out, grace upon grace upon grace upon me, is so that I can be gracious to others by the way I live and the way I love. We're going to quickly go through some of the times that the ver verb usage of agape is used first, and then we're going to look at the noun usage in the book Gospel of John. John 3.16, you know it well. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. This is a verb. Verse 19, which Teresa read also, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. I'm going back to my devotions already and remembering Rome, what we're reading in Romans. John 3.35, the Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. John 8, 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Chapter 10, verse 17, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. And 12, 43, for, the, for they loved human praise more than the praise from God. Now I read you up to chapter 12, because I already told you chapter 13 is where we go in and get personal with Jesus. And what does He do for the example that He gives us of love? He humbles Himself and washes the feet of His disciples. A job that we need to do, and we need to think of it in many ways, the humbling of it as a ser servant slave was the one who does that job, but also in the fact that if we are, as, as Peter did not understand, if we are cleaned, if we are part of the body of Christ, we continually need to watch, watch, wash each other's feet because if we're getting out in the world, our feet are getting dirty, aren't they? And that means that we're going to be tempted by the things in the world because we live set apart, but we still live in this world. This is still our mission field. So again, if I did it on my own and I went out here proclaiming the gospel message and everything, and I didn't have you... My, the, my brothers and sisters, the body beside of me, I could very well fall into the temptation that I was out in out there and, and fall away and slip my footing. But I have you and I to be with each other, upholding each other, going on this race, running with perseverance, the race marked out before us as we read in Hebrew. Okay, the noun version in the first 12 chapters. John 5, 42, But I know you, I know that... 
I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. That's the noun version. These are people that professed to know Jesus, wanted to be associated with Jesus, but Jesus said back to them, I know you, and I don't know you personally. Why? Because you don't have the love of God in your hearts. It's not affected your mind, where it affects your heart, where it affects what you do. Okay. Now we've got the verb usage in the next chapters of John. John chapter 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for Him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them till the end. Two verb usages there. What's He do after that? He washes disciples' feet, tells them to do the same, and He tells them how they'll be known by, by their love. Chapter 13, verse 34. A few verses later. A new command I give you, love one another. How? As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, then keep my commands. 14:21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. 14:23. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and He will come to them and make our home with them. Look how things have changed in the word usage of the verb agape love in John. When it, you get intimate with Jesus, if in fact you are. 14:24. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Verse 28, you heard me say I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Verse 31, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. 15 verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. 15 verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Verse 17, this is my command, love each other. Now the noun usage in the chapters. 1334 was a new command I give you, love, which is a verb, one another, as I have loved you, verb again. You must also love, verb usage, one another. Verse 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love, noun usage, one another. Boom. A new command I give you, love one another as, as I have loved you. Now, this is, the, this is the, the, the plumb line that we're using. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The proof of the pudding. 15 verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. There's your noun. Uh, 15 verse 10, If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's command and remain in His love. 15 verse 13, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Are you understanding what God's love for you means? Okay, let's go to 1 John and do the same thing. 1 John chapter 2, verse 10. I'm going to go through them quickly. These are the verb usage of agape. Wow, look how many there are. <laughs> 2.10, anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them that makes them stumble. 2.15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. 3.10, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. 3.11, for this is the message you heard from the beginning, we should love one another. Verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. 3.18, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Verse 23, And this is His command to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as He has commanded us. Chapter 4, verse 7, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. 
4, 8, whoever does not love God does not know God because God is love. 4.10, this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. Verse 19, we love because He first loved us. Verse 20, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Verse 21, and He has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And ironically, that was yesterday's scripture reading for our devotion. <laughs> ironically, I'm saying that in pun and fun. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Everyone who believes that Jesus is, is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know, verse 2, that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. There is your proof of the pudding in chapter 5. Now, how many times was that? A bunch. Here's the noun usage. I'm going to do it just as fast. Some of these verbs will be some of these verses will be the same because there was a verb and a noun in them. Okay? Chapter 2, verse 5. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. How we know, without a doubt. 3 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that they did not know him. 316, this is how we know what love is. 316, oh, as opposed to John 316. <laughs> this is how we know. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. And this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Wow. Verse 17, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? 4, 7, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. 4, 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. 4, 9, this is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son in the world that we might live through Him. Verse 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. Verse 16, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Verse 17, this is how love is made complete among us so that we have complete confidence on the day of judgment in this world we are like Jesus 4:18 there is no fear in love but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment the one who fears is not made perfect in love now let me tell you again that was Saturday's devotion I wrote the sermon on Thursday I had not read Saturday's devotion I did look to see where we were supposed to read in Genesis and Romans and wherever so that I could read that scripture and put it into the sermon. And like I said, I was able to do, with working, read all of the scripture readings in three days and not have any trouble doing that. Probably did not spend as much time still in those three days as I did physically eating food. And I gave you the example of Fruit Loops last week. We get the example of pudding this week. Right, and you girls already know which one's pudding. Yeah, you can see, but they don't know yet, okay? And then 5, verse 3, In fact, this is love for God, to keep His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. Now, His command is not to read that devotional. <laughs> now, I'm not commanding you to do it, but His command is to stay in the Word. And Jesus, when tempted by Satan in the wilderness, when Satan said, eat something, you're hungry, Jesus, and use Scripture to, to try to twist God's words, Jesus said, man must not live by bread alone. And I could give you so many more references that if you're not re constantly reading God's Word, if you're not in a routine and in a plan, 
There will be days when you don't have the nourishment that you need to face the things that the devil will throw at you. But if you're constantly in fellowship with one another, if you're constantly thanking God and praising Him, singing psalms, reading His Word, then you will have a better chance of fending off the devil when those things come. You still need prayer, interceding prayers from us, and so much more. You need to confess your sins. That John says that in 1 John. I may go there next week, but that's the whole thing. If you do sin, if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 5 verse 1, Everyone who believes that Jesus is, is the Christ is born of God. There's, if you believe, you're saved. Here's the proof. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. Verse 2, this is how we know that we love the, chil we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. Verse 3, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands and his commands are not burdensome. So will you commit to reading the devotional? I know you might have another plan, but I'm going to be preaching somewhere out of this. And the, what I tried to do last year was go through what we read and try to motivate you and spur you, maybe give you some insight that you didn't see before. Say, oh, so maybe you'd even go back and taste it again to see how good God's Word is. Because the more that you read God's Word, the more things are going to, to, to come out and speak to you because it's alive it's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing in and cutting out, dividing soul and spirit. When I read Genesis again, I picked up things that I'd never caught before, and then I spent time studying. And I was like, why did I not catch this before? Because God didn't reveal it to me then, plain and simple, because He wanted me to keep reading, to keep eating, so that I'd reveal and say, what, what, what is that that I'm tasting here? Okay, taste time. Bring your pudding over here. Proof is in the pudding, right? Okay, now watch this. Watch their re reply. <laughs> Hush, Fred. Okay, you want to taste this one? Sure. You can say no. Okay, you want to taste this one? Yeah. Okay, do you want to taste this one? Sure. <laughs> You're supposed to say no, but <laughs> you can taste it. Taste it. Try it. All right, is this one better? Try it. Are you a pudding fan? It's not going to work as well if you don't like pudding. Okay. Is that pudding? Yes. Okay, do you, you want to taste the other one? I'll give you a cup too for that. <laughs> it's not bad because it's milk and cornstarch and flour. I didn't put enough cornstarch because it didn't set up. But there's an obvious difference. Which one is the pudding? Okay, you girls can eat it if you want it to. Thank you for your help. You made it, you can eat it. Yeah, you can choose which one you want to eat. But when they started, you couldn't really tell a difference. And maybe that was your walk with Christ. You should be more like Christ today than you were yesterday. If you're reading God's Word and He is sanctifying you through His Spirit and through His truth, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. Well, I'll use this instead of that. <sighs> to get God's Word in me this way. But it just does not work. <laughs> Doesn't work. I've tried doing this. But this works. And every time that I read it, my Father speaks to me. And is making me more into His image and making the things that I used to think that I thought I had to have that I desired, less desirable. And I want to be more like Him, to know Him more and more. <clears throat> if you believe, and you've taken up the position of being a disciple, then Jesus clearly taught us 
that it's a life of love. It's something that you've got to spend the time on, and as you spend the time, you will see the results. If you remember at the end of John, you went all through that process, and Peter denied Jesus three times, but three times Jesus went on to say, if you do you love me first, and then if you profess that you love me, then feed my sheep. And I told you last week that the second time in the usage of that, ver that word, that's why studying the words help a little bit, that that second usage was not just to feed as to feed a farm animal, but it was to feed and tend for and care for, and then feed them some more. That's why Jesus, the last day that he was there, loved them and loved them to the end and set forth the example of washing their feet. I'll do whatever it takes to love you and let you see this. And, and you're going to see this right after this. No greater love does a man have than to lay down his life for his friends. And he told the crowds before that, unless a kernel of grain falls to the ground and dies, there won't be a crop. What are you holding on to that's keeping you from living a life that proves without a doubt that you know that you won't have to worry on that day that you know Jesus Christ. Christ. John 13, 34, and 35. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. 1 John 2, 3. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In 1 John 5, 3, loving God means keeping His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. You know, I used to think reading the Bible was a burden. Where would I, when was I going to find time in my busy schedule to take the time that I needed? Oh, and if I took five minutes, woo -hoo, if I took ten minutes, even better. If I took a half hour, I'm really doing something, Lord. Now, whenever I can, whenever there's a free minute and I'm trying to condition and train myself to take time, it nourishes my soul so that I am more like Christ in this world today. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that you would love us so much that you would send your Son to die for our sins, to be humiliated and spat upon, to have to be raised by the very creation that he created. And you did all of this because you love us. And you left us here to do greater things than Jesus did in the flesh by being united and being a royal priesthood, by being known as a loving nation. As we read through your word again this year, help us to look at the mistakes from Israel and not do those same things. Look at our mistakes in our past. To, just to look forward for the day that we meet Jesus face to face. To look forward to the cross with joy for taking up whatever that instrument of suffering and persecution is because our Lord and Savior per was persecuted and died to save us. Father, we thank you for your love and that you would come to dwell with us where we could cry out and call you our Father. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.